Hello there, thanks for joining me this Sunday. I'm Sabrina Zainal and these are the headlines tonight. MCA against any alliance with us. Police score major success with seizure of the largest drug bust in Kelantan. And Finance Minister questions 96% drop in consolidated account. We begin the bulletin with outgoing MCA President Dr. Sri Liao Tiong Lai, who has warned that MCA would move to dissolve Barisan National BN or kick AMNO out of the coalition if the party formalizes an alliance with PAS. Speaking at the Slangor MCA convention 2018 today, Dr. Sri Liao deemed the alliance as a move towards theocratic politics. Uh, kita bersama Barisan Nasional. Tapi Barisan Nasional itu adalah menunjukkan Barisan Nasional itu moderate. Semangat pada Barisan Nasional adalah moderate. Semangat Barisan Nasional adalah inclusive, harmony and unity. Tapi kalau mana-mana komponen parti yang keluar daripada falsafah ini, maka dua jalan saja. Sama ada uh, dia kita... Robo kan, ataupun kita dismiss the whole part component, or we kick out whoever who is extreme. So we have to keep Barisan uh, Nasional as a moderate. So it's either way. So kita jelas. Dr. Sri Liao also rejected calls for his party to abandon BN, saying instead that it is not MCA that is in violation of the coalition's principles. He also said that he had conveyed to UMNO that MCA disagrees with any forms of coalition to which UMNO has given its assurance that there will only be cooperation on certain issues. Now, the finance minister has urged Dr. Sri Muhammad Najib Tun Razak to explain the drastic drop in the consolidated revenue account, which, according to Lim Guan Eng, is a drastic drop of 11.41 billion ringgit, or 96%, in the fund over a four-month period from December 21, 2017 to April 30th this year. Lim said the situation had left the Pakatan Harapan government with only 450 million ringgit. In a statement today, Lim said that the monthly financial statements of the government was prepared by the Account General Department. The Finance Minister pointed out that there was only 450 million ringgit when the government's emoluments and pension payments alone amounted to more than 8 billion ringgit a month. Lim asked if the former Prime Minister is still at a loss to understand what constitutes a consolidated revenue account and claimed that Dr. Sri Najib had wrongly assumed that the total amount in the consolidated fund was available for use as, legally, the government could only use the consolidated revenue account for its operating expenditures. He emphasized that the former Premier seemed to have difficulty in distinguishing its difference with the consolidated fund, stating that, as of December 31, 2017, the federal government had 18.06 billion ringgit to spend and not 11.86 billion ringgit, as revealed by Datuk Sri Najib. He also noted that the difference was clearly used for spending for the 14th general election to try to help Barisan National win. Moving on, police scored a major success with the seizure of pills worth 23.6 million ringgit in a raid near Pasir Mas, Kelantan last Thursday. It is believed that the massive packs of pills were brought in from a neighboring country to be sold to drug addicts in Kota Baru and Rantau Panjang. A police team raided the house in Kampung Bangalut Stol, Alo Pasir, at about 1.15 a.m., following a tip-off on drug activities being held at the place. A 31-year-old lorry driver had also been picked up to assist the probe and has been remanded for seven days beginning September 20th.
An initial investigation showed that the man, who had no previous criminal record and tested negative in a urine test, was the storekeeper. He is believed to be one of the local drug syndicate members and has been active in the illegal activity since August last year. Police also seized a Produa Kanchil and a television in the raid. Now on to the alcohol poisoning cases. Perak's third death was recorded yesterday at the Raja Pramaisuri Bainun Hospital, while another victim is in critical condition. The cases are also spreading, with Nagri Sambilan emerging as the fourth state to be affected, with one methanol poisoning case reported yesterday. The total number of cases recorded by the Health Ministry so far are 86, involving Slangor, Kuala Lumpur, Pera, and now Negeri Sembilan. Of that total, 33 deaths have been reported, involving both locals and foreigners. Slangor recorded 24 deaths, Kuala Lumpur 6, while Pera had 3. So far, no deaths have been recorded in Negeri Sembilan. Meanwhile, the health ministry confirmed that two brands of liquor which caused deaths contained a high level of methanol, about 17 percent, which contravenes the Food Act 1983. Health Director General Datuk Dr. Noor Hisham Abdullah in a statement said the products did not follow labeling requirements under the Food Regulations 1985 and under the Food Act 1983, such as the absence of the name and address of the manufacturer, importer or agent. According to Section 13 of the Food Act, any person preparing or selling any food which has any substance which is poisonous or harmful to health commits an offence. The punishment and upon conviction is a fine of up to 100,000 ringgit, a jail term of up to 10 years, or both. So far, up to 402 premises selling alcohol have been inspected. 1,471 bottles of alcohol of various brands which violate the Food Act and food regulations have also been confiscated. Now for the unofficial results of the Penang PKR Division polls. Former PKR Deputy President Datuk Sri Muhammad Azmin Ali is leading by 3,326 votes, followed closely by contender Rafizi Ramli at 3,150 votes for the Deputy President position. Citing viral media reports, the Vice President post is led by Nurul Iza Anwar at 323 votes, followed by Zuraida Kamarudin at 158 votes, Tian Chua, 139 votes, and Dato Johari Abdul with 124 votes. For the post of party president, Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim won uncontested. Yesterday, members from the 13 PKR Pulau Penang divisions casted their votes, although polls at several divisions were delayed due to technical problems with the newly implemented e-voting system. Now, 13 men aged between 20 and 50 have been remanded for three days by the Sungai Petani Sessions Court beginning today to assist in a police investigation over a brawl that broke out during the PKR Merbot Divisional Elections in Kedah yesterday. Another man in his 50s that was detained was released on police bail due to health reasons. Close to 20 men were involved in the scuffle, using brooms and plastic pipes to hit one another, following an earlier commotion amid voting. The incident also went viral on social media before an earlier arrest was made involving four individuals. Following that, 10 more men were arrested, bringing the total number of detainees to 14. Now, Pera PKR Chairman Dr. Dr. Muhammad Noor Manuti is urging to revert to the manual system for the elections instead of using the e-voting system. This was following the commotion and anger after the system malfunctioned during polling in the northern zone yesterday. Tensions flared amid the e-voting glitches in Kedah and Pulau Pinang, with polling at nine Kedah divisions postponed. The party was also forced to postpone the polls in Pera and Perlis. Although the, the decision by the CEC must be respected, Dr. Dr. Muhammad Noor said the committee must be responsible in ensuring that the failure does not recur to preserve the party's good name. Saya mengesyorkan jatuh kuasa pemilihan parti untuk menggunakan kaedah manual yang diguna pakai sebelum ini sebagai alternatif kerana tempoh pemilihan semula tidak boleh ditunda bagi tempoh yang lebih lama demi menjaga moral anggota-anggota parti yang kian yang kini sudah bersiap 
menghadapi PRK Port Dickson tidak lama lagi. Saya sebagai The Perak PKR chairman was speaking at an emergency press conference in Ipoh last night. The decision to cancel party polls came as a shock to many, especially the 24 Perak divisions, after PKR President-elect Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim delivered his premier ad address at the press conference. The PKR Perlis Division agrees and is making a similar urge. Its chairman, Muhammad Faisal Abdul Rahman, wants the conventional voting system to be used for the party polls this time around, as party members are already doubting the e-voting system, which was only introduced this year. Muhammad Faisal said he expected the e-voting system failure to happen when initial problems that occurred during dry runs could not be resolved. He is also proposing for the system to be reviewed by commissioning other companies that are better qualified to do the job. Now, in Kelantan, the Kota Baru Sessions Court ordered the Kampung Tualang Mahat Tafiz Al Hashimi in Kuala Krai to pay compensation totaling to some 4.3 million ringgit to former students who were involved in a road accident in June last year. The cost involved compensation to 18 year old Muhammad Faiz Hafizuddin, who sustained injuries to his head and spine in the accident involving a van which paralyzed him for life. Judge Nasri Ismail during the verdict said that three of the four defendants, the van driver Muhammad Hamzi Muhammad Husham, CT1 Corporation Sundir and Burhad, and Mahat Tafiz Al Hashimi, are vicariously liable to pay the compensation to Muhammad Faiz and his mother, Jah Suryawani Mustafa. However, the Mahat Tafiz principal, Muhammad Khalidi Che Harun, was not ordered to pay compensation. The case began last April and the trial took two days involving four witnesses. As for the van, the students were not covered by insurance and it was driven by a driver who did not possess a driving license. In the accident in June last year, seven of the 12 Tafi students, including a student from Thailand, were on their way to attend a Quran program in Kota Baru when the van skidded and crashed into a house in Kuala Krai, killing them on the spot. Meanwhile, operators of restaurants and food outlets will be asked to reduce their service charge rates so as to not burden the people. Finance Minister Lim Guan Eng said the current 10% service charge at eateries is felt to be on the high side. Now, he said the government had relaxed many conditions for these operators that should allow them to reduce their service charge. This included revising the annual turnover threshold for eateries at 1.5 million ringgit, SST exemptions on cigarettes for outlets that don't exceed the threshold value of 500,000 ringgit annually, and on rental of small stalls within a particular shop's compound. While understanding that the service charge collection is used to cover workers' wages, Lim said the rate should still be reduced. He also admitted that the implementation of the SST has somewhat contributed to an increase in prices for certain items, but comparatively no higher than during the implementation of the GST. Now, the draft National Higher Education Fund Corporation, PTPTN, repayment method would be tabled to the Cabinet in two weeks' time. Its chairman, Wan Saifu Wan Jun, said today, even though the amount of arrears was very high, he said the PTPTN had the responsibility to assist borrowers to pay off their loans. Wan Saifu, however, did not disclose the content of the draft. Earlier today, the Education Ministry to called on all quarters, including the opposition, to seize linking the PTPTN with Pakatan Harapan's 14th general election manifesto. Its minister, Dr. Mazli Malik, said borrowers of any loans were obliged to settle their repayments. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad had three days ago expressed regret with the attitude of PTPTN borrowers who have not made their repayments. He said that PTPTN has accumulated 36 billion ringgit in unpaid loans. After the break, teens' foolish Facebook Live invite lures unwanted guests. This and more when we return.
thanks for staying with us. Now let's take a look at our daily segment, Clickbait, for what's trending and making rounds in the cyber world today. Teenagers are usually fueled by hormonal imbalances, which drive them to do things they might regret doing as they become adults. It's understandable that these actions are caused by clouded judgment and the urge to attract attention. Recently, a teenager who goes by the name of Sapik went on Facebook Live to vent his anger, but what happened afterwards has caught everyone by surprise. The boy was taunting local gangs in town who were dissatisfied with him to come look for him so they could fight face to face, at the same time spewing a lot of vulgar words in the live session. Well, he got his wish fulfilled because not long after that, two adult men came to him, grabbed him and started to teach him a lesson. They reprimanded him by asking him to sing the national anthem, followed by him doing bodyweight squads and apologizing to his audience. He has, since then, come out with another apology, expressing his regrets on the matter and mentioned that he has learnt his lesson. As much as we do not condone violence and disagree with the actions of the two men beating him up, in a way, it served him as a reminder to anyone out there to be more careful with their words. As we all know, the K-pop industry is phenomenal that it has fanatics from all over the world. A recently released music video features the controversial Najib clown painting by local artist Fahmi Reza, leaving both the artist and netizens amused. This has caught the attention of Malaysians when the graphic artist posted about the cameo appearance in a tweet asking if the K-pop artist even knew who the person in the caricature was. Apparently, the K-pop group did not seek permission from Fami to use the cartoon in the music video as one of his followers asked him if they did. The Najib Clown cartoon, which appeared twice in the music video, Falling in Love, has over a minute's worth of screen time and has garnered over 450,000 views since it was uploaded in June this year. Last February, the same cartoon had landed Fami behind bars for a month and he was found guilty under Section 233 of the Multimedia and Communication Act 1998. Now updated as of 7 p.m., here are the top trending topics and searches on the internet today. Now it's time for our My Game On segment, bringing you the latest esports news. For the first time in history, esports was showcased and highlighted at the Malaysian Games Sukma. One is Islam, who was in Ipoh Pera, visited the esports Sukma experience to find out more. Welcome to My Game On, where we deliver you the latest esports news reviews and updates with a local twist. Now, I'm currently here at Stadium Indira Mulia in Ipoh Pera, where the esports experience under Sukma is currently underway. Let's go find out more and see what's happening inside. So, what exactly is the esports Sukma experience? Basically, it's an exhibition show match between professional players as well as the public. Now, behind these doors, we'll see a number of people playing a number of gaming titles, which include that of FIFA 18, as well as Pro Evolution Soccer 18, as well as Mobile Legends Bang Bang, between two of the top teams in Malaysia, which is that of Air Asia Saiyan and Honor Mysterious Assassins. More than 20 professional esports athletes from Malaysia participated in exhibition matches at the Indra Mulya Stadium in Ipoh Pera. The event helped recognize the pro players' efforts in trying to change the public's perceptions on professional gaming. We don't just want to give it acknowledgement and recognition by words, we want to give it acknowledgement and recognition by action. We thought we'll just uh, make sure there is this esports experience here for everyone to see. Uh, number one, our full commitment, the Parrot State Games' fullest commitment 
to, towards esports, and secondly, well, to show people what the, the, the extent of the interest out there is towards esports. Uh, there needs to be a bit of a paradigm shift towards public perception towards esports. Esports fanatics of all ages had the opportunity to not only meet their icons, but also compete with them during the MVP challenges. A total of six gaming titles were showcased, including FIFA 18, Pro Evolution Soccer 18, PUBG Mobile and Mobile Legends. Meanwhile, Youth and Sports Minister Said Sadiq Said Abdul Rahman recognised the professional esports athletes who have represented Malaysia in previous international tournaments. Among those athletes include professional FIFA and Pro Evolution soccer players, as well as Mobile Legends teams. Because for me, this is a history event because it will be a first step to go esports in Perak. I also feel so happy and honoured to be part of this history, and as a one of the pro players, I feel happy because I can get uh, get interacted with the Pera eSports community. And and this event is very, very good event because uh, this event is a one step further to launch eSports in Sukma, which is Sukma Malaysia, and give uh, opportunities to anyone to which uh, to anyone that like to play games and want to join eSports in the in the future. Giving this kind of exposure to the public, this is one of an uh, opportunity for the female to see that the gaming is not just playing for fun. This is something that we can build for the career. Commenting on the event, Said Sadiq recognized the limitations in acknowledging esports in Sukma. However, the games would not have been a success without the support of the organizing committee and the state government. First thing first, while this might not be the biggest of place, but this is the first time that any state government has put esports into Sukma, at least as a demonstrative sport, but this is the first. And I'm very sure that this won't be the last, there'll be a lot more. From there onward, I think there will be improvements and it will get bigger and bigger. Obviously, the recognition should be more. There should be greater government assistance, not just from the state level, but from the federal level, at the same time to pull a larger crowd and for more participants and more games to be played as well. I'm, I'm thinking now immediately Daily, I'm thinking uh, Pera or Ipo as uh, esports heaven, and I want everybody from all over the world to be here competing in esports. Coming up on Seven Edition, heavy overnight downpour kills one. Don't go away. And we're back with world news. Campaigning for Indonesia's presidential election officially began on Sunday with the two contenders vowing a peaceful race after concerns that the campaign would sharpen religious and ethnic divides. The election due in April pits incumbent Joko Widodo, or better known as Jokowi, against former general and ultra-nationalist Prabowo Subianto, who lost to Jokowi back in 2014. Kami. Kami. Peserta Pemilu Tahun 2019, Pemilu tahun 2019. Berjanji, berjanji Satu, satu mewujudkan, pemilu yang langsung, mewujudkan Pemilu yang langsung Umum, umum Bebas, bebas rahasia, rahasia Jujur dan adil both leaders, dressed in traditional Indonesian folk costumes, attended the official campaign launch in central Jakarta early this morning that was shortly followed by the release of white doves to symbolize peace ahead. The two contenders are both pushing for a nationalistic economic platform, but issues of race and religion loom large in the battle to run the country. Karena itu yang jadi yang kedua adalah masalah ekonomi kalau saya lihat masalah ekonomi ini di bawah ini PHK udah banyak gitu ya 
apalagi tenaga dari luar sudah masuk. Opinion polls show Jokowi, whose down-to-earth style and ambitious infrastructure drive have made him popular with many Indonesians, well ahead of his main challenger, Prabowo Subianto. But his bid for a second term is facing headwinds over his economic and religious record, with the rupiah currency sitting at a two-decade low and accusations that he is a Christian and the son of Chinese communists. At the same time, some polls show the gap between the incumbent and Prabowo narrowing as the campaign begins. Jokowi's five-year term has been spent mostly on balancing the demands of the powerful Islamic conservatives and the military, but many Indonesians still yearn for the strongman-type leadership represented by Suharto-era figures such as Prabowo. Some 186 million voters in the world's largest Muslim-majority country are expected to go to the polls on April 17th. Moving on to tennis now, Osaka's winning streak has come to an end. The U.S. Open champion hadn't dropped a set since her fourth round encounter with Arina Sabalenka in Flushing Meadows and won her first eight points on serve before showing signs of nerves. But in Sunday's match in Tokyo, former world number one Karolina Pliskova ended Osaka's excellent adventure at the Torre Pan Pacific Open, snapping the 20-year-old's 10-match win streak to triumph 6-4, 6-4 and win her 11th career title. Both players dominated on serve throughout the opening set, but while Pliskova capitalized on her only break opportunity, Osaka failed to even push her Czech opponent to deuce. At 2-all, Osaka had a brief lapse on her serve, allowing Pliskova to pounce and earn the only break she would need in the opening frame. The serving cl clinic continued from both sides of the net, but a string of errors, including a double fault, put the Japanese behind nil 40. Pliskova didn't waste any time in completing the break, ripping a forehand winner after a failed Osaka drop shot. The Czech then finished the match off in fitting form with a hold at love that included a pair of aces in just under 64 minutes. Now that's all for the evening. To wrap up Summer Edition, we leave you with light shows and art installations which brighten the streets of Portugal's Casque Resort Town, leaving visitors in awe for the 7th edition of the Lumina Festival. I'm Sabrina Zainal. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Good night.